So first of all, thank you for having us, and uh, we're really glad to be here and to be part of this uh, event. Um, you know, we, we do this type of, you know, going through this type of information with patients when we see them in clinic, but a lot of times it can be very overwhelming. And uh, with, with any disease, really, education is key, and knowledge is, gives you that information to make the decisions. So I think it's really admirable that you're all here. Our focus is in terms of systemic therapy, so chemotherapy and drug therapy for pancreas cancer. Again, the majority of patients presenting with pancreas cancer do present with advanced disease. So at some point in, in their trajectory, most patients will, re will be receiving chemotherapy or some form of drug. So we'll just jump right into things. So with our cases, we wanted to look at the, I wanted to go over the um, different phases of pancreas cancer. So patients presenting with resectable disease, so that's cancer that's it, with, just within the pancreas and that the surgeons can operate on. Then we've got patients with, on the other side, metastatic disease. So that's generally patients who have disease in the liver, lungs, lymph nodes, and so on, that we know that there's no possibility of them having uh, surgery. In between those, then you've got this mishmash of patients with what we call locally advanced disease. And actually, that's become somewhat of a heterogeneous group because you've got patients in there who will never have surgery. And then there are some patients who may have the potential to have an operation with some new experimental and aggressive approaches that I'm going to talk to you about. So we'll start with resectable patients. So this is a typical patient. So we've got a 62-year-old man who, goes, who has a past medical history of diabetes. He was just diagnosed in the last year. He's been on medication and doing well. History of smoking. And his diabetes was the wake-up call for him to quit smoking. Drinks alcohol occasionally. And oh, he, um, he was fine, feeling well, and then over about a two-week period, started developing some yellowing of his skin that he actually didn't notice. Family members kind of said, you know what, you look a little bit yellow. He went to see his family doctor who said, you need to go to the emergency room right away. And in the emergency room, he had investigations. So I guess the first thing I wanted to talk about is uh, the symptoms of pancreas cancer. So Libby kind of alluded to this. We, I have some figures here to just show you the location of the pancreas. And you can see with the, in the graphic there, you can see the location of the pancreas, which is where the tumors develop, explains the, t the symptoms, the different spectrum of symptoms that patients present with. So the majority of patients present with, either with obstruction of the biliary system. So I don't have, actually have a point, but you can see there the bile ducts. So the yellowing of the skin, the dark urine, the pale stools. If they present like that pretty acutely, then patients usually seek medical attention and they're diagnosed early. So it's no surprise, and that the majority of patients who are presenting with resectable disease are actually those that present like this with jaundice. Um, the same way you have blockage of the biliary system, you have blockage of the pancreas ducts, and then those patients usually present with uh, in pancreas insufficiency, so they don't have the enzymes to digest their food. So they might have diarrhea, weight loss, and a lot of patients just will report a 20 or 30 pound weight loss over a period of time. And it's unfortunate because we often see a lot of patients who come to us saying, yeah, I'd lost 20 pounds and I really wasn't doing anything, but I thought it was because, you know, I was happy because I'd lost weight and I was planning to lose weight. So mm -hmm. um, the other thing that uh, we wanted to, talk, to just mention is this idea about diabetes. Um, we see a lot of patients who are diagnosed with diabetes just prior to their presentation with pancreas cancer. And there's some research going on in that area in terms of what the cause and effect is, so is the diagnosis of diabetes related to pancreas cancer, is pancreas cancer, occult pancreatic cancer that's not yet diagnosed, then manifest by a new diagnosis of diabetes. Um, the other symptoms, again, constitutional symptoms, so pay, pay, people might come into their family doctor complaining of poor energy, no appetite, weight loss, vague symptoms that can be really hard to pinpoint. Um, and I think it's important, so we see we see all cancer patients, right? So everybody who comes to see us is a cancer patient. And I know it's very frustrating for patients when they say, I've had symptoms for four or five months and no one's done anything. And it's difficult, but we have to also remember that family doctors are seeing everything and not everyone with back pain has pancreas cancer. But if everyone with back pain was having a CT scan to look for pancreas cancer, then the patients who actually did have pancreas cancer would be waiting a much longer time. So it's often difficult. And I don't know what the right answer is. I'm not trying to say that we, shouldn't, we should be investigating everyone within the first week of their symptoms, but 
it's important to remember that too, and it's unfortunate that pancreas cancer, just like many of the other cancers we deal with, the symptoms are very, come on very slowly, and they can easily be explained by something else. But these are the main symptoms that people with pancreas cancer present with. And then uh, we, we could talk about how we investigate pancreas cancer. So mm -hmm. these are some of the investigations that people have before they come in to meet us. So blood tests, again, blood tests, generally just looking at organ function, but there's no real good blood marker that will help diagnose pancreas cancer. Uh, imaging is helpful, CT scans, ultrasounds. You'll hear uh, information about PET scans, but again, uh, the standard PET scan, the FDG PET scan, still an investigation in terms of how useful it is in terms of diagnosing pancreas cancer, so it's not something that's considered standard. And then to establish a diagnosis, we use a combination of imaging as well as uh, procedures. So we've got, uh, just got a picture there of an ERCP, which is how we sometimes get brushings and uh, to establish a diagnosis. I mean, I think if you can go, just go back there. So mm -hmm. part of the, uh, next slide here. So part of the, so this is a CT scan. So somebody lying on the table and, uh, and we're looking. And so this is, this is the region of the pancreas around here. And, and what you can sort of see here that is that unlike something like this, this is the aorta, for example. This sticks out really brightly. You can see it. This is not so easy to see. It, it's a little bit darker than surrounding tissues. It's a little bit blurry. So you can imagine that using something like a CT scan to detect things early is going to be very difficult because it, it, it's all kind of fuzzy over here. And as we, one of the issues that, that would be really helpful would be some kind of a test that would pick pancreas cancer up before people get diabetes, before people have pain, before people lose weight. And <clears throat> there's a lot of work going on in that. In fact, we all hear about this 16-year-old guy from uh, <laughs> wherever who's on it, who's on Dr. Phil and uh, Jimmy Kimmel. But, uh, but I think that the, the thinking is that most likely it's going to come through the blood. It is, is, if, if there was something that the cancer was producing that uh, we could detect in the blood, much like with prostate cancer, for example, we have a PSA test. That's not perfect, but uh, that would be kind of ideal to pick things up at a time that we can do something because it, it isn't particularly helpful to pick up pancreatic cancer at a time that it's grown into surrounding tissues and we can't remove it. We have to pick it up at a time that the surgeons who are coming next can deal with it. And there are some blood tests that we use to monitor pancreatic cancer, but at the present time, they're not sensitive enough to really uh, allow us to use it as, as a screening tool. But, <clears throat> I mean, I think we're quite optimistic about that because what's happening now is, is we're creating these huge banks of blood uh, on patients. And the hope is that as, as we develop new, uh, identify new proteins, for example, that are in pancreatic cancer, maybe we can go back to these blood samples from patients and see, you know, could we detect this at an early stage? Could we use this as a screening test? So there's a lot of work going on at, at, in that area, uh, but at the present time, uh, as I said, we don't have anything that we sort of ready for prime time. Okay, so just in terms of, there are a few recognized risk factors in terms of patients developing diabetes, pancreas cancer, um, and the age, uh, history of smoking, diet, so more in terms of a Western diet, high in meat and so on. But again, how much any of these factors actually contribute to <coughs> patients developing pancreas cancer and everyone, in, in everyone the risk would be a little bit different as well. Um, there's also an association with chronic pancreas uh, inflammation, so pancreatitis and some familial pancreatitis syndromes. Uh, and I mentioned the diabetes uh, already. Um, familial cancer syndromes I'm not going to touch on because Steve Gallinger is going to deal with that, I believe, uh, after this talk. Nisha, I was just going to add that often people come to us without having any high risk mm -hmm. um, behaviors around smoking or poor diet or things like that, and that's very that's very difficult for people to uh, to hear that there there isn't necessarily a risk that is identified in in something that they've been doing in their life. So, so, and I think the other important thing to keep in mind is that these are the patients with early disease, with localized disease, who are going to have surgery. Um, but uh, 
the outcomes can still be quite poor, and this is just pointing to the fact that we need to develop new treatments, and there are studies that are going on, and we've got one running that we're participating on at PMH um, that we're excited about. So, and we are seeing some improvements in terms of uh, the use of adjuvant treatments, so developing more effective adjuvant treatment, um, potentially new adjuvant treatment, is um, something that we're very excited about. Again, these, I, I just want to show a few graphs to show you some of the improvements, uh, and this explains why we do what we do. So generally, patients like, like this patient would come in, they'd be seen by the surgeon. If the surgeons can do an operation, the patient would go through half the operation. Then they come and see us, the medical oncologists. And a lot of times patients will then come and say, well, I've, fit, I've had my surgery, I have no cancer. I, I'm finished, I don't need any more treatment. That's when we recommend chemotherapy. And again, CT scans look clear. Patients have no evidence of disease, but we know that the patients are at a risk of having disease recurrence, so we'd recommend chemotherapy. And we know that outcomes are better with the use of six months of gemcitabine. Five-year overall survival, there's a doubling. So before using adjuvant chemotherapy, the outcomes were 9% survival at five years, and that now looks more like 21% at five years. So that's a pretty impressive improvement. We know that, and I'll talk a little bit in the um, metastatic case about more effective treatments in the metastatic setting. And what we're, what's exciting is if we see those improvements in the metastatic setting in patients with advanced disease, then potentially incorporating that early on in the disease will lead to even more improvements, and that's where we're going to cure patients with pancreas cancer. What this, uh, so this tells you a couple of things. First of all, if you look at the curve on the left here, the bottom one, so what it tells you is that even when we can do surgery, pancreatic cancer is really a disease of the whole body. And whether it's, it's a function of stimulating the immune system or giving chemotherapy, uh, really to, to effectively control pancreatic cancer, it's going to be a combination of surgery and some sort of what we would call systemic uh, therapy. The other point here is that this, this sort of approach of giving chemotherapy after surgery when there isn't very much cancer left in the body uh, is, is kind of the standard approach in most cancers. So, for example, breast cancer, colon cancer, uh, even stomach cancer, uh, it's very typical now after surgery to have some form of chemotherapy to try and eliminate whatever little bit of cancer might be left behind. Um, so just to sum up then our approach in patients with resectable disease, so the most important thing, and I'll say this time and time again, that the most important thing in patients with pancreas cancer is managing symptoms. So even while we're trying to develop an approach to actually treating the disease, we need to treat all the symptoms. We need to manage pain. We need to make sure that the biliary system is drained, that patients are on enzymes, that they're maintaining their performance status as best as possible because that's the only way they can get through treatment. It's the only way they can get through surgery. That's the only way they can get through chemotherapy. Um, and, and that's how we know we can help improve their, their quality of life. Um, <clears throat> there's a few ways to approach diagnosis, investigations, as well as imaging-based. Again, patients who are being considered for surgery tend to not have biopsies done beforehand. Um, some of them may have an ERCP if they need to have to relieve the biliary obstruction, but most times patients will, the surgeons will try to get patients to the operating room as quickly as possible. Um, so you want to have surgery in a high volume center where there's a lot of expertise in that area. Um, and when, patient, when surgeons are doing uh, a lot of these operations, then there's also the potential to do um, experimental approaches and to try to push the envelope a bit. So, We'll talk a little bit about that and adjuvant chemotherapy. So just again, to, so now, you know, Princess Margaret, we're a big center and uh, we're not just saying you, people should have surgery in high volume centers because we want, we need the business. There's very good, uh, these are, these, this is complicated stuff uh, and um, not that necessarily breast and colon cancer are simple, but they are, they are easier to deal with. And there's very good evidence for pancreas cancer that if you have surgery at a place that does more than 10 operations a year, uh, the outcome of the patients is much better. And uh, so, because 15, 20 years ago in Ontario, I, I think Steve would know better, but we probably had 20 or more hospitals in the province doing s surgery for pancreatic cancer. And uh, Cancer Care Ontario, through its quality program, has really shrunk this down to a much smaller number. 
for, for that reason, because the outcomes are better. So that now, basically in, in Toronto, uh, there's Princess Margaret. We probably do 75% of all the surgery for the GTA, and then the rest is done at Sunnybrook and St. Joseph's, and no other hospital would undertake uh, to do that. The other part that's quite tricky uh, is this part of, um, there, there's a whole field around this idea of when you obstruct the bile duct so the liver isn't draining, how you fix that. And uh, we're very fortunate in Toronto to have probably the best uh, group in the world at St. Michael's. And so um, in some parts of the world, uh, you know, this, the biliary stenting and, and all that thing would be at the same place where the surgery is done. But the quality of the people at St. Michael's in Toronto is so good that we've elected uh, to work with them as opposed to developing our own service here. And for any of you who've been through that service, uh, you know, it's, it's an outstanding, <coughs> very efficient service. And they're kind of the world leaders in new technologies in getting things done. And, and one of the things we often can help patients with when they come to the McCain Center is if, if they've tried to have some sort of stenting or something done uh, out in the community, often we can get them to St. Mike's and they'll be able to fix problems that uh, it can't be fixed otherwise. And, and it's, it's more relevant as we go on to the, the cases where we don't do surgery but getting the, getting the liver working properly is essential uh, before you can really treat patients with, with pancreatic cancer. So it's really a key part of the whole program, which is why we're so closely linked with St. Michael's. I want to switch gears a little bit um, because I've, I've spoken a little bit about clinical trials and the fact that we need better drugs. Uh, we know that pancreas cancer is a systemic disease, so patients will need drug therapy. And so far, for many, for most of our drug studies, how they've been conducted is in patients, all comers, pancreas cancer. So all patients would be treated exactly the same way. Sometimes some biomarkers are collected, something tissue or imaging or other things are done, but most times the information hasn't been adequate. So we're not, we haven't been able to go back and look at that and say which patients have responded, how can we choose the best treatments. And ultimately, we need to move forward with clinical trials, and we need to continue developing new drugs, but I think we also need to take a step back and learn more about the biology of this disease. And a lot of times where we have that opportunity to learn about the biology of pancreas cancer is in those patients who are having surgery because those are the patients where we have a large tumor that we can look at. Uh, in patients who are with uh, more advanced disease, we have these biopsies. And Dr. Moore already alluded to the fact that most times, and I've got some histology slides there that you can see, there's small nests of tumor in a lot of stroma and a lot of dense um, connective tissue. You biopsy that, you look at that under a microscope, and you're not actually going to learn a lot about the tumor cells themselves, although we know that the stroma is also important in those interactions. So something that I've been interested in, and we've been interested in Princess Margaret for quite some time, is looking at hypoxia or levels of oxygen within tumors. We've got two studies that are going on at Princess Margaret right now, um, and hypoxia in pancreas cancer is something that has been in the literature for a long time. Um, there's always been theories that pancreas cancer is so difficult to treat because chemotherapy can't get into the tumors, that there's not a good blood supply. This is why it's so aggressive. There are new treatments that are being developed now that actually target levels of hypoxia within tumors, so they're activated in those parts of the tumors that have low levels of oxygen. But before we look at that, and again, these studies are going on, and they're, they're treating patients with all different tumors, um, all patients with pancreas cancer. But what we need to understand, what, what are, what's the range? What, are, what do all pancreas cancers look like? Do all pancreas cancers have these low levels of oxygen? And we know that there's such heterogeneity in terms of how patients behave, and that's reflected in the tumors themselves. So I just wanted to show you some images here. These are PET scans, but they're not the PET scans that you hear about. They're not FDG that are based on glucose. These are hypoxia PET scans. So there's a tracer that's inactive, and it's only activated in those parts of the tumors that have low levels of oxygen. And so, Actually, don't worry about the bottom slide. The bottom's actually cervix cancer. But they, that's just to show you a, the, the different uh, levels of uptake of the tracer. But here we've got a pancreas, and there's a tumor in there, and there's very low uptake. This is really bright, and that's just excretion of the tracer in the kidneys, in the kidneys, because that's how the tracer gets out of the system. And in this one, we have, this is the liver. The liver is a bit hypoxic, and also has enzymes that reduce the tracer, so that's why you see this blush of red. 
but then we also see uptake here in the pancreas. And it's not very dramatic, but this was very exciting for us because this meant that we could see levels of hypoxia in those tumors. But more importantly, we could see a difference from this tumor to that tumor. So that was based on imaging that we can do on patients without actually taking a tumor out. What we're doing actually is doing these uh, imaging studies, but then also take, when the surgeons take the tumors out, we then look at hypoxia with a special stain. So patients get this mar marker before the, the day before they have their surgery. And the brown staining here shows, the, the brown staining is the hypoxia marker that only lights up in those parts of the tumors that have low levels of oxygen. So here we have a tumor where the marker doesn't light up at all, means that there, this appears to be an oxygenated tumor versus this tumor, and the graph just shows you the range. And again, this is, these are studies that are going on that are not developing drugs, are not going to, at the end of the day, change the outcome for patients, these patients, but they're gonna give us information that we can then use to the other studies that I'm gonna tell you about, because there is a study of a hypoxia targeting drug that we will be participating on. So this, I think, is the way the field is evolving in terms of learning more about the biology of cancer so that we can then develop better tr treatments. So if we get back to this patient, so he um, had a CT scan. Um, he needed a stent. He had some brushings that demonstrated that were positive, demonstrating malignancy. Uh, he came to the McCain Center for his evaluation, saw the surgeons, was deemed to be resectable. He participated on our studies, and then he went to surgery. And then he came back to see us to talk about chemotherapy. We have a, a clinical trial right now of gemcitabine versus fulfirinox, which is another chemotherapy regimen that most of you probably have heard about. Um, and some patients are eligible to participate on that. He participated on that and was on chemotherapy. So now we move on to uh, patients with locally advanced disease. So this is a little bit of a different situation. So again, similar presentation. This is a 54-year-old man who had four months of back pain, was being treated for musculoskeletal pain with anti-inflammatories, no improvement. Ultimately, his family doctor decided to do some imaging. He had an ultrasound which showed a suspicious mass. And from there, he was referred to the McCain Center. And what we've tried to do um, at McCain, so prior to this, um, most patients would have more of a workup before they came into Princess Margaret in terms of trying to get biopsies done, trying to get imaging done. We're trying to get patients into the system a little bit faster because we recognize that for patients with pancreas cancer, time is of the essence, that we do need to expedite things. And for doctors in the community, whether they're family doctors or internists or any physicians, it is difficult to get access to CT scans and so on. They have to wait two or three months sometimes. So now I just wanted to go through a little bit of what our patient flow is like in the McCain Center. I don't know, Allison, do you want to jump Yeah, I, I wouldn't mind speaking to it and just adding to a bit what you were saying, because it's not only the, uh, the referral into us, which is, is really important because as most people's experiences, there's a number of months leading up to it, but it's also um, even coming into us and many other hospitals you will have experienced going through, you know, seeing a surgeon and then often being referred to a medical oncologist and maybe a radiation oncologist and maybe having to have repeat scans and biopsies. And a lot of that is very back and forth. And what we wanted to do is not only to try and, and shrink that, that time frame that that happens, but try and coordinate it so that it's going through you know, one center, one group of individuals and professionals who are working together so that we can, we can make sure you're seeing the right person at the right time and that it's happening in a timely way. Um, and so the first aspect that we wanted to look at was really looking at how the referrals come into us and making sure that we have a single point of contact both for referrers but also for patients and families so that there's not a lot of confusion about who you should be talking to and, and who do you need to see and who you should be calling. And so um, we have a central referral and, a, and um, our admin assistant will contact people within 24 to 48 hours to say we've received the referral and we may already have an appointment and organized by that to really try and reduce that level of anxiety around, you know, is something just sitting on a fax machine and, and not being dealt with. Um, but also once that is happening, to have myself as a clinical point of contact for questions, um, because obviously we may not be seeing somebody the, the next day or even the day after that, but a lot of patients present to us with 
not only a lot of questions and concerns, but a lot of symptoms as well. And we want to make sure in the interim of getting all of these test books and seeing us that, that people remain well um, and have access to, to medical care if needed. Uh, and then coming to us, the, the ideas within the McCain Center is being to, able to um, access the different professionals that they may need. So if we know that they're the receptacles, if we can tell that, or if they're this locally advanced, we want to make sure that they're seeing the surgeon and then also either on the same day or very quickly soon after seeing the medical oncologist so that we can get all of that work together and get the appropriate test scheduled because Everybody comes in with a different amount of workup. Some people may not have had CT scans. Some people will already have biopsies. And, and we want to make sure we're coordinating if they need anything repeated or, or that. So that's sort of the first piece is the central referral and booking. We've also created a clinic just for pancreatic patients and really streamlined how they come in and the time frame that we see them. The multidisciplinary consultation also includes radiation oncology. We'll talk a bit about that because it's not, uh, um, not as common to be seen by them, but we want to make sure we incorporate it as necessary. Um, the urgent access to imaging and biopsies, um, and that's a problem at all centers, is, is really being able to get people seen in a timely way when there's so many different diagnoses and diseases going through. Um, and accessing our team at St. Mike's as well, the colleagues there. Um, and then a rapid assessment by the supportive care team and allied health. So setting up a clinic that's just for pancreatic pan patients was also trying to incorporate as much as we can into one visit, but also providing either access to um, our, our other professionals, our allied health teams at that moment, or at least an introduction so that we're making the referrals for the, the whole patient experience around um, the symptoms, and we'll get into symptoms a bit later, but symptom management for dietitians, social worker, uh, counselors and therapists, psychosocial oncology, um, uh, and, and palliative care, and, and being able to manage the, the, the patients right from the first time that they meet us. Um, and then also integrating our clinical trials into that. So I'm sure uh, uh, Nisha will touch on that a bit more, but having our clinical trials discussed and introduced right on that first appointment and all of the research that people might be eligible for with, with our research coordinator who is here in the audience and really having that one point of contact as well. So we try and fit everything in but also reduce the number of people that you might have to meet so it's not, you know, it's, it's very overwhelming and can be quite confusing and we want to try and streamline that as much as possible. What we wanted to do was we have three of us, three medical oncologists who see the bulk of the pancreatic cases. We have five surgeons who see the bulk of the cases. So we wanted to make sure that the experience for the patient was the same, uh, whoever they would see, whether they'd see me or Nisha. And the other thing is that the way the health system traditionally has been organized has been around convenience for providers. So it's convenient for me to see patients on Tuesday, so I see patients on Tuesday. It's convenient for Steve to see patients on Thursday because he has lab on Friday. So we said, you know, we've got to change that and we've got to say, well, what's, you know, what's more convenient for patients is if they can come in and if they need to see a, a medical oncologist and a surgeon and a radiation oncologist, they should be able to see them all on Thursday. So we reorganizing our own work so that we could provide all these services uh, was, I would say, more complicated than we had anticipated because because if, 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 if I have to move, if Nisha has to move her clinic to Thursday from Monday, that creates all kind of, so it's, it actually was a, I think we're pretty well there, but it, it, it was, it was a lot, it was quite complicated to try and organize all these services so that, uh, and the thing that I think inspired people to want to do it was we said, you know, if we're really providing patient-centered care, patients, when they come in, want to get everybody's opinion so that when they leave, and, and this is our goal, that when people leave from their first visit to our clinic, they either have a clear plan, a treatment plan, or at least a clear plan for you're going to have a biopsy, you're going to have this test, and you're going to come back in two weeks and, or a week, and we'll make a decision. So that, that's kind of what we're aiming for, is that first visit, and in fact, what we've sort of discovered now uh, is 
that we're probably overwhelming people a little bit because we have like uh, the Allison, uh, the oncologists, the, the psychosocial, nutrition. So we're trying to figure out, you know, how to kind of spread it out a bit so that people can access the services at a at a time that that's convenient. Um, and. Again, so I mentioned that these patients that are considered locally advanced, it's a, it's a mixed bag, it's a heterogeneous group. Um, and I think there are multiple aspects to the care of these patients, and that's why these patients are actually very well served by um, being seen in, our, in the McCain Clinic, because it really is something that kind of evolves as, as we're seeing the patient in the clinic. Um, the first thing is uh, they're reviewed by the surgeon to decide if they really truly are unresectable. Um, we have a new protocol that will be starting within the next few months, next couple of months for uh, surgery. So patients, um, there are patients who may be able to have surgery for pancreatic cancer, a specialized operation that includes resection of special blood vessels that may be involved. We don't yet know whether or not it's a reasonable thing to do that operation. Sometimes just because the surgeons can technically do an operation doesn't necessarily mean that patients will be helped by an operation. And our surgical oncologists are very good at understanding that balance. And so sometimes they'll offer patient surgery. I mean, they will only offer patient surgery if they, know, if they feel that the patients will benefit from that treatment. In the specific case of pancreas cancer, there, there might be patients who might be considered technically unresectable, but if they have this more aggressive surgery, um, they can have, the, have an operation and have their entire tumor removed. In those situations, we think potentially because pancreas cancer is an advanced disease that it's likely that there's microscopic disease outside the pancreas, outside what we can see on a CT scan, maybe they need to have some treatment beforehand, so some chemotherapy, chemotherapy and radiation. So we've developed this into a very specialized protocol so that we'll be following patients very closely on a regimen of chemotherapy and chemotherapy and radiation and then go on to have surgery. Um, and uh, surgeons from other centers in, in um, Toronto are sending us patients to be considered for this as well. And then we'll be able to address whether or not the, this type of operation, a more aggressive operation, is helping a certain subset of, uh, of patients. If there are patients are, that are not eligible for that protocol, then we would look at um, starting systemic therapy, so chemotherapy and potentially clinical trials. So there are some studies that uh, are specific for patients with metastatic disease, so disease that's spread outside the pancreas. But some of our studies do allow patients with locally advanced disease. So this would be an option that um, if that study is not available at another center, then a patient with locally advanced disease should come to Princess Margaret to be considered for this. So we've got a study that is open right now, gemcitabine plus TH302, which is the hypoxia-activated drug that I mentioned before that patients might, be, might go on. Radiation is possibly, it's likely only for specific indications, so help, helpful for managing pain and other symptoms. Um, there was a study recently published, presented, um, demonstrating no improvement in survival with the addition of radiation, but for some patients, radiation might be a helpful addition. So that's why we do have our radiation colleagues as part of the um, McCain uh, Center. That's just the, um, the data from the radiation study. So again, so patients with locally advanced disease, again, the most important thing is symptom control. So managing if they have biliary obstruction, if patients have other symptoms in terms of problems with eating because of gastric outlet obstruction, some patients may need stenting for that. And again, our St. Mike's um, gastroenterologist uh, help us with that as well. Some patients may have surgery, the majority will never have surgery, and there may be specific clinical trials that they'll be eligible for. Um, so in, in this particular case, this is a patient who, was re who came to see us, had their CT scans organized for the following week, uh, had their imaging reviewed by the surgeons at their HPB rounds, and was deemed to be a candidate for this specialized protocol. The following week was seen by medical oncology, radiation oncology, to be started on uh, the treatment protocol. So finally, this is the majority of what we see is patients with metastatic disease. So here we've got a CT scan that just shows you tumors within the liver. So it's a 67-year-old woman, um, some high blood pressure and diabetes, but otherwise pretty well, good performance status, has a family history of bro both breast and ovarian cancer. She saw her family physician for her routine physical, and then while she was there, she mentioned, you know what, I, I've, I have lost 30 pounds, but I, was, I thought it would be good for my diabetes, um, and I haven't really been feeling as, as energetic, and, and my appetite's been down a bit. So the family doctor organized an ultrasound which demonstrated multiple lesions within the liver and some abnormality in the pancreas. 
And again, this is a patient who might have waited for a biopsy before coming to McCain, but if this referral comes to us, then we organize this CT scans, biopsies, and so on so that we can expedite things. This particular patient had a biopsy. Um, we have uh, another study going on at, at Princess Margaret right now. Again, it's, it's to help us understand more about the biology of these, these diseases. So in a patient who is having a biopsy for us to determine the diagnosis, they can agree, if they are agreeable, to providing us some extra tissue, so the radiologist will take a couple of extra cores so that we could do research studies on these. One of the things that we're interested in is growing these tumor cores in mice to develop xenografts, so similar to what we're doing in patients who are having surgery. So then we'll have models that are developed from these patients with metastatic disease for doing drug testing, for doing other types of investigations so that we could learn more about how these tumors behave in mice. There's also, we also have a, a BRCA screening study, so all patients with pancreas cancer that are diagnosed at the Toronto General and Princess Margaret are being screened for BRCA mutations. Again, this is a familial cancer syndrome. It's um, about 5% of pancreas cancers have been linked with BRCA mutations, and again, Dr. Gallinger is going to deal with this, so I'm not going to talk too much about it. The other study that we, are, um, we have going on at Princess Margaret is the impact mutational profiling. So this is something where patients who have a uh, tumor available um, if they consent to participating on this, we can profile the mutations that are present in a patient's tumor. And that information is added to the patient's clinical chart so that then their oncologist can look at it and say, is there a clinical trial that would make sense for this patient? So it's a way to personalize clinical trials for that patient. The studies that are available may be available through our group, so through the pancreas group, or potentially through our phase one group where they're developing new targeted therapies. Um, but again, it just provides additional information and additional options for patients down the line. And so this is a patient who would have, we would have discussed treatment, chemotherapy, and then this is really important where we need to have a lot of input from psychosocial oncology and palliative care. Yeah, and I, just to add to that is, is really we want to be, we try to talk about this in the first visit, and, and again, that can be quite overwhelming. And then continue to bring it up in multiple visits because the diagnosis itself is is very difficult to process and, and understand and we want to make sure that people are accessing all of the services that are available um, and not only within our hospital but within the community as well um, to help patients and families with this and and so a lot of this may not have been discussed before and and the the concept of adjusting to the diagnosis and and going on on treatment often get sort of pushed uh, to the back when you're getting all of these tests and trying to get on treatment and all of that, but it is really part of what we want to focus on to make sure um, people are remaining well and having a level of quality of life and can access people outside of, of their, their family to talk about. And, and family members can also be seen by our psychosocial oncology team. Um, and really we like to start that up front so that you know, things are already in place if they want to access this as, as it goes forward. And we're linked with uh, um, one of the psychiatrists in our psychosocial oncology team specializes in pancreatic cancer and does a lot of research around that as well. So we have a number of research studies um, linked with uh, our psychosocial oncology team and different therapies that are, that are offered through them, so. And I, you know, I think, you know, th this crowd is pretty knowledgeable about pancreatic cancer, but I would say the majority of people that we see probably have never even heard of it. Uh, so it's all a bit of a shock. So patients and families are dealing with, first of all, a patient doesn't generally feel very well. Plus they've been told they've got this very serious illness. Plus they're worrying about well, what am I gonna do about my job and working and uh, so there's a lot going on. And uh, we find, and we, because we're, we're, we're very focused on, you know, this is the treatment, this is the biopsy, we found it very helpful to have somebody else sit down with them and screen everybody. What we also find, frankly, uh, is that individuals and families differ in when they want this information. Like some people uh, prefer not to have detailed discussions or find it very upsetting. So we don't, uh, so we sort of let people know that this is available to you at a time you feel that you want to have further discussions about it. Uh, and so we tend to screen everybody and some people immediately go into the program and others. Um, the other thing that's definitely true is that I think patients do not tell doctors the level of distress that they're having. 
uh, in terms of emotional distress. We, it's often, often patients, I think, will minimize that when they're talking to the physicians. And often having a, uh, one of our psychiatrists go in and delve into it, we discover a lot of kind of useful information that we wouldn't otherwise have known about. I'm old enough to have been uh, here at the start of, of everything in terms of the treatment of pancreatic So 20 years ago, uh, there really was essentially no treatment for, no systemic treatment for pancreatic cancer. And uh, so we evolved to this first drug called GEM or gemcitabine, which um, showed a modest benefit. And one of the ways to look at this is, the proportion of people who were living a year with pancreatic cancer. So you can see 5-FU was a relatively ineffective treatment, but you can see that essentially nobody is living for a year. This is like 20 years ago. So with gemcitabine and the first wave of chemotherapy, we're now up to about 20, on average, it's about 20% of people who would live a year. And then just show me the next slide. So now as we get into these newer treatments, and we can tell you as much or as little as you want to hear about these different recipes and the pros and cons of them, but what you sort of see is that we now have the second generation of treatments for pancreatic cancer. Gemcitabine is a relatively simple treatment. It's given once a week. There's not a lot of the typical chemo side effects to it. So it's good in the sense that it's a gentle treatment and patients don't suffer from the treatment itself. But you can see that as you get into these more aggressive cocktails, if you like, what you're seeing now is around 40 to 50% of people are living a year. So this is one such cocktail called Fulfirinox, which is just kind of a short form of four different drugs that are in this cocktail. Or this is another one, um, Nabpaclitaxel or, or Braxane with gemcitabine, where again, you're seeing that about uh, 40% of people are living for a year. So we now, when we talk to patients about chemotherapy, we do have options in terms of uh, more aggressive versus less aggressive treatments. And, and honestly, some patients uh, elect this, this treatment, which is more effective, as you can imagine, has more side effects. And people, would, it, this has more of the typical chemotherapy side effects like nausea, diarrhea. And, and so some patients wa who want a more aggressive treatment will elect for that. Others will not want to put themselves through you know, the side effects. But I think if, if, if we reference this then back to what Andrew was, would be talking about this morning, this is all, we're, we're kind of hoping that this is the end of this sort of age of treating cancer. So these, in all of these studies, what we basically have done is taken every, every patient with pancreatic cancer, exposed them to these treatments without any prior knowledge about whether these treatments are going to work for that specific individual. And these sorts of drugs are relatively nonspecific. They damage cells that are growing. So they damage cancer cells, but they damage you know, your gut cells, you'll lose your hair, those kinds of things. And so, you know, these, these drugs have some value, but as we look to the future, what we see is this idea of using chemotherapy in patients where we have some ability to predict that it's the right treatment for them, and then also using these other types of drugs. Nisha referred to one, which is a drug which targets hypoxia. Then we have all these new molecular, so-called molecular targeted therapies for specific genetic mutations. So we might use those in different, different drugs in different people. So the, the, the general idea then is that rather than having everybody with pancreas cancer come in and get full Fearnox, you may have 30 different treatments for people based on whether the tumor is hypoxic, what genetic mutations you have. The other, the other area that's quite exciting uh, and has really had a renaissance is this whole idea of taking the immune system and turning the immune system, your own immune system to fight the cancer. And this, is, this idea has been around for a long time, uh, but recently as we've gotten more uh, sophisticated in understanding the immune system, we have with some cancers been able to turn the immune system on the cancer 
and have very significant benefits. And the best example of that is, is a, a disease called melanoma, a form of skin cancer, which used to be as resistant, if not more resistant, to chemotherapy than pancreatic cancer is. And now there are a whole host of treatments which target the immune system, which are having quite dramatic effects on melanoma. And we feel that pancreas cancer is a good target for this because if you look at, um, if you look at these tumors, there's a lot of immune and inflammatory cells in the tumor, which suggests that something is going on. So it's just a question of priming the immune system to work in a better way to, to fight these cancers. So the, the, uh, while there's been some progress to date, the future, we are quite optimistic about the future, uh, looking at immunotherapy, targeting hypoxia, targeting specific genetic mutations. And that's kind of, I hope when we're giving this talk 10 or 15 years from now, that uh, the curves that we're showing you relate to those kinds of things. We've probably honestly, with, with, with the old style chemotherapies, which are what these are, this is probably as much benefit as you can get. Uh, to, to, to take to the next level, uh, we need these newer types of approaches, these personalized approaches. And maybe the last thing I would say is that this, this sort of stepwise approach of improvements is typically the way cancer improvements go. You don't, it's very rare that it, with cancers you go from, you know, 90% of patients dying of cancer to 90% of patients being cured with one step. It, it doesn't happen that way. It sort of tends to happen in little pieces. And, and as you can imagine, for example, if, if you could take the patients who've had surgery and, uh, see this same sort of incremental benefit with fulfirinox rather than gemcitabine, those are patients who are being potentially cured. So often when you take these aggressive chemos and bring them earlier into the disease, they can have more substantial sort of benefits. So that's kind of how it works. To uh, pick up on something Allison said about palliative care, um, when I first went into treatment I had a lot of trouble managing the pain and I was sent right up to palliative care and the first thing I said to the doctor was, what am I doing here? You're freaking me out. <laughs> and uh, a lot of people feel that way and um, there's a problem here, probably all across the country, accessing palliative care when you really need it. And there are also studies, not in pancreatic cancer, but in other cancers that show that people who are on palliative care actually live longer. So I just wanted to make the point, because I've, I've heard from a lot of people who are afraid of that word, as I was, and um, I think it's, we shouldn't be afraid of the word, if anybody has any I'll, I'll just add, most people will present to us with significant symptoms, and, and pain <coughs> management can be very complex, and it requires a lot of attention. We may be tweaking things and need to phone every single day or see people very frequently, and our palliative care team are experts in, in managing those symptoms. And some of these drugs are not things that Malcolm or Nisha or I would see very frequently, and they would. So once we get beyond sort of the basic um, opioids or other symptom um, drugs for uh, nausea and vomiting, they have a huge breadth of knowledge in drugs that are used for symptoms that aren't necessarily common in what we would see day to day. So we do often refer for the symptom management piece as early as we possibly can with the fact that they are experts in that and then can provide things ongoing as it's needed. You know, in, in Libby's case, you know, she was able to access them and then and then not need them after that. And so that is is how they work not only in our organization but in a lot of organizations that they're they can be episodic or they can be involved as needed for the symptoms. Um, and, and supportive care needs going forward. So it is, it is a really important thing, and when we bring it up, it, is, it has nothing to do with prognosis and everything to do with the type of care that they um, provide and complement to, to us as well.